You are now listening to Out of the Blank. 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 Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Trez Dank. What's up, Trez? Hey, how's it going, Rob? You know what? It's crazy because I say Trez, but I've always known you as Uncle Trez. Yeah, that's right. So it's a little bit different. Right. So all I know is that you're a tattoo artist. What do you do professionally, really? Right. Um, I mean, actually, that is my profession, tattooing, the course. And then I've been a community organizer for about eight years. And I started a nonprofit group to build mountain bike trails. Now, how did exactly did you get into tattooing? I did about uh, a little over 10 years of restaurant work to start out my, you know, my life as a young man. And then uh, one of the restaurants I worked for needed T-shirts printed and I had gone to school for commercial art. And so I began working for a company that printed shirts for local restaurants and businesses, uh, eventually bought that business from the owner, moved it into Ocean City and was not only printing shirts for marinas and uh, restaurants and bars and stuff like that uh fishing boats but uh making our own original artwork so i'd been to a couple dead shows and i made a t-shirt and grateful dead merchandise caught me and they you know i got in trouble for having merchandise that looked like theirs and it was like an epiphany i was like well why don't i just make up my own designs they can't stop me from selling t-shirts the reason they were stopping me was the shirts had the tour dates on them. It had, you know, specific information to the band. So I just avoided that. After that, I started making shirts and just kind of uh, acknowledging the kind of the coexistence. Like if there was lyrics from the song that I liked, Spiral Light of Venus was one of the designs I did. And it's more of a, you know, just a cool looking tribally, I don't know. It was very tattoo oriented, I guess, yeah. to other people. I didn't realize that at the time. But shortly after I started making the art, tattooers started coming into the shop. As soon as they saw my art, they were like, you know, we want to trade ink for ink. Have you always uh, had skill in just art in general? Because it seems like with every painter, every like drawer, everything, that's usually how it starts off. Like it's something, then they turn it into a career, they kind of stick with it, or they just never pick it up. And it's like, it's hard to tell because I mean, I can't draw for shit, basically. Like when drawing feet, hands, anything, it's not very good. But I've I've seen some talented people. Put the shapes down, man. It's just. It's just practice. Every time someone says that to me, they say, I can't draw a stick figure. And I said, well, that's where it starts. First, you have to start drawing stick figures. That's how all everything's laid out in proportion. So you you sketch out all the shapes into the sizes that they need to be. And if you want it to look cooler than that, then you change those sizes and shapes, like foreshortening and a cartoon character when they're reaching out at you. Yeah. You just have to imagine what that looks like and then draw the picture bigger in the foreground and smaller in the background. And, you know, going to school for... Uh, helps with specific details like um, uh, perspective, drawing one point, two point perspective, stuff like that. But um, I always like when I'm tattooing people, I have plenty of time to tell stories. And that I like to talk about my grandmother making the money tree and decorating for events where it was like fundraisers. And her brother had a, a cool sh- uh, outbuilding that was like a carpenter's shack. And I would just hang out in there when I was a little kid when we would be in Baltimore. because I grew up in Pennsylvania, but I was from uh, Sparrows Point, Dundalk area. And over on Merritt Boulevard, my grandmom's house was on this junkyard in the back. So we'd hang out in these wrecked cars all the time. And then when it would get dark out, we'd go in the wood shop and look at all the tools. And I feel like it just is part of the way I was raised. Yeah, it felt natural. Yeah. to just used the tools to make stuff that looked neat, you know, make it, take it another step. You know, well, even going from screen printing or making your own designs as well, just being able to put that on someone's skin too. Like that's got to be, first of all, that's got to feel great. The whole factor is that you're going to be able to create something and literally put it onto someone's skin, you know. and More so them. they can't lose it or throw it away. When I ask them where that piece of art was that I gave them. Yeah. <laughs> With the tattoos, they can't yeah. say, um. Yeah. It's you know, on their they know it. They know yeah. they have it. They might not remember where it is. That's one of the funny things. The first thing people do with tats on their back is show you the wrong side of their back. Well, how did you try and even find your style in the first place? Because it seems like with every artist, they usually adopt a bunch of different forms and kind of watch a little bit from like glass blowers and things of that sort. But how did you find your unique niche? Because I mean, it, right. throughout my whole entire life, like I said, I've only known you as a tattoo artist. Yeah. And that's just because my mom's like, if you're ever going to get a tattoo, it's yeah. coming from him. It's not coming that's from anybody sure. else. I definitely do everyone's first tattoo. Um, or, you know, like to claim that. I always say I'm going to get a 
going to get like a cherry tattoo someday because I just do a lot of first timers. And uh, I'm thinking about a heart on the ankle. Right. I guess I, yeah, style wise, <sighs> to answer the question, I just don't necessarily have a particular aesthetic I'm trying to put into the world. I'm more trying to help people that are kind of in that on the other side of the bar where they just they haven't decided that yet either. And then, I, you know, going to school for commercial art kind of ruined me for fine art. I always want to have the other person's input. So another, you know, like I was saying, I, I, when I'm tattooing people, I have plenty of time to tell stories. And one of my favorite analogies is I call it a couch. And so the premise is you have you see a piece of art that I did and you're like, man, that's beautiful. It just doesn't match my couch. You know, and I'm commercial artist. I would say, you know, well, give me a color swatch and I'll make you one that matches your couch. Yeah. Fine artist says buy a new fucking couch. Yeah, I mean, you know, and so there's a there's a pin there's a point at which there's no returning from one side or the other. You know, either you're going to keep working with the person or you're just not. And I've always been able to kind of keep working with the person, but there's been people that I couldn't figure out a way to help them and get them on tattoo. It's like once two people start a business together, then you know they try and branch off each other's ideas. Then if one person has one idea, sure. the other person's like, let's not do it. Then they just drop it. Yeah, that really helps having a we you know our tattoo shop uh, shop uh, independent tattoo. When it started from 97 to 99, there was at least six artists, if not more. And I was working shoulder to shoulder with people in a 10 by 10 space, you know, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, more than 10 hours in a day. Whereas these days, everybody has their own 10 by 10 space and you only do one or two a day. Um, you need that personal space. Too. Well, yeah, but the point being is working with all those other artists helps tremendously uh, when you can bounce ideas off of each other and. I mean, anything from whether or not we should tattoo minors, you know, kind of the more of the morality of tattooing. You know, I also like to say, you know, some tattooers, there's might be kind of a code that they just don't feel you're worthy of their tattoos. So I don't go there. You know what I mean? I'll tattoo pretty much anything on anybody, um, but not a swastika on a, you know, a racist, you know. Does that get difficult, though? Like someone comes in and wants to get a gang tattoo. Like, I don't know if, you know, mm -hmm. there's this dude in Virginia that's now getting his face like all the tattoo laser sure, off sure and he did the juggalos right so i'm like first of all they even have that idea of wanting to come into a place and then get that on your face like your whole right face that's what i'm talking about up. it's hard to it's hard to turn down the money and to tell the person uh you know another analogy is when someone comes to me with an idea that they say you know what would be funny i'll say it might not be funny forever you know <laughs> that's kind of the the catch 22 of that that's where the yin and the yang gets thicker and thinner is you know you ha you know the longer i've done it the more apparent it is that everything is uh what's the old saying is as above so below mm -hmm. so the more that you think you have the most original idea the less likely that's really true <laughs> and on the other side of the coin uh, coin no matter how hard you're trying to be impressive to somebody it's not going to come over that way it's going to come off as you know a lack of um uh, what do you want to call it? Like confidence. And so just like fashion, you know, anybody can wear a pink Oxford, but not everybody can rock it. You know, yeah. some people look fine, uh, you know, or so, you know, I mean, it's a bad example, but with tattoos, that's kind of the issue is that like a tank you know, top. It either works on like a fat guy or a really jacked guy. It doesn't really work on skinny people. <laughs> you just wear multiple ones. Exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's crazy because like, what would you consider to be one of the most difficult things just even that you've come across doing tattooing? Like I'm talking about like when it comes oh, to- Oh, that's it. The theme, like people's theme of their life. It's almost like musicians are playing the soundtrack of your life. Mm -hmm. We're kind of, you know, the way my tattoo reads out, you know, my wife is a musician. So my tattoo of the geisha reminds me of her, the dogs protecting our family. And then my sacred heart, my sacred heart has my wedding band through it with the fish representing the kids. You know, people want that out of their tattoos. Uh, and then that's the challenge is making them realize that each one of the tattoos means all of that. You know, not yeah. just the one thing. And then, you know, they're like potato chips. You know, the more you get them, the more you get over the worry of whether or not to get them because like now a, you got one. It's like a puzzle piece to a person. You get to figure out what they all mean. Like someone starts explaining a tattoo. There's always usually a story behind it. I just find that like if I'm looking at like Gucci Mane. Well, now the story's in front of it, I guess you could say. Yeah. The problem for me is that people come in wanting to tell me this long-winded story without ever leaving a deposit or paying me for that time. So no. that gets a little bit fishy, you know, I want to be there for them and listen and give them the lip service they deserve. Like I said, I don't want to turn anybody down, but sometimes it's almost like they're trying to get out of it already. 
they're telling you, they're giving you these obstacles that you really can't even hurdle. You're like, you know, I feel like their idea is when they leave, they're going to say, oh, that guy couldn't even do the tattoo I wanted. But I can do any tattoo you want. You have to actually want it. <laughs> you have to really go through and get it, you know. And that's what's funny about tattoos. There's no coming back. You do have to get it. How many times do you have to reject someone just because you feel like they're not ready for a tattoo? Virtually never. I mean, I feel like there's they reject themselves. I'm so open and available that I have a long list of people that never finished their tattoos. You know, I think all of us do tattoo wise. You always have high hopes for the bigger back pieces and stuff and the people can just never finish it. Um, and so that's the struggle, you know, is you have when you're when the person's walking in, you kind of have to like you want to think about it, but you don't want to give them too many options. You know, I try to only draw one drawing, the drawing they're getting, you know. So that's a, a break away from commercial art. They expect, you know, maybe three or four different ideas or drawings of those so they can think about it. But I'm the thinker, you know, that's what Denk means. D-E-N-K is think in German. And it's just, you know, once I have the idea, then it's getting it to look right. And there is occasions when I just can't do that for the person. So hopefully I can find another artist that would be able to fill my, you know, fill in the void that just does that kind of style, whether it's photographic realism. Or even more, you know, of a certain style, like specific tribal stuff um, to polka trash tats, like the ones with all the dots and the dashes and stuff, you know, like splattered all over the person, big, huge stuff, guys from Poland. Um, you should go get that from them. You know, people bring yeah. me those pictures and I can emulate it. Exactly. I can copy it to a T, but I feel like that's what's missing in tattooing is, you know, we're all held to this higher standard to be able to do every style like on Ink Master, but then you can't, how are you going to hone in on your style if you're always available for every style, you know, and that's the catch 22 that I kind of enjoy about it. I don't know what I'm going to get when I get to work, you know, could be a cover up, could be uh, most of the time lately, it's been memorials and stuff. So it's somewhat depressing. <laughs> yeah. You gave me the best advice when I was little and I was asking you like, what well, what tattoo would I want to get or something if I want to get this? And I was shooting off a bunch of ideas and you were like, why don't you think about it for a while? And I thought like, okay, maybe next week I'll come back to you or something. This was a mm -hmm. little before I could even get a tattoo. And um, you're like, Let's try seven months. And I was like, seven months? And you're like, yeah, you want to think long and hard, make sure that, that when this goes on your skin, you're not going to want it off. Like it, right. either find something that means something to you or find something that you really, really enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely think about it because I, I feel like a lot of the times you're just seeing kids put stuff on their skin. I work with a kid who's got, you know, he's a good dude, but he's got like, so many tattoos on his body. He's like, I regret getting this one. I regret getting this one. And especially like around high school, kids are starting to do it themselves. Well, for us, regret is good. It, it's kind of like the pain part of the tattoo. It's what makes the person feel alive. And they don't get it. They don't understand or know it. They, you know, depending on their upbringing and, and their street smarts and sense that, you know, not everyone can see all the different facets of life at once. You know, so challenge for us is to encompass that listen to the person's you know ideas and everything and then boil it down to a symbol of all of that you know so it can take years i mean i've worked on a design for multiple years for a person uh, and i do make extra color copies and stuff for people that you know put the extra effort in too so it's a it's a you know more or less each person has to put in the effort i can tell when a customer is really just you know Hasn't there, thought about it, you know, there'd be difficult. I mean, I mean, when the person says they've been thinking about it their whole life and I say, what do you want to get? And they don't know. What am I supposed to say? You're a liar. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, so you have not been thinking about this your whole life or it's more of a, it becomes a figure of speech. Well, that that's what's weird about my whole life is become for us. It's like a figure of speech and we take it seriously. It is. It is my whole life. I've been tattooing over 20 years. You know, what you said with the commercial thing, too, like the whole idea was that you're so willing to like, you know, OK, yeah, we'll do this or, you know, we'll do that. Or maybe, you know, that whole thing, it kind of takes out the original creativity. People are coming to you for an idea as well. So people are coming like, I want this in mind. And oh, you, you might. Yeah, yesterday, walk in tat. I got to show you now that we're thinking about it, because it's cool how both can exist simultaneously. If it's possible to do it in the same day, I will, because I think it's fun. So this is um, out in West Virginia. They have a, a Mothman. And this, uh, yeah, this guy, right. Dean, wanted to do the Mothman eating baked beans. And I tried not to question it as long as I could. And then finally, I was like, what's up with the baked beans? But that was during the tattoo. Like, I just, he just said, you know, that's just my thing or whatever. You know, we didn't really, I didn't hound him about it. I just needed to know what was up to kind of move forward, you know. Yeah. Then while we're tattooing and we had this conversation about the beans and, you know, I got to know the story behind it. And that's more fun than him coming in talking about the story about these beans forever. 
and never get into what he actually wanted, which was the Mothman tattoo. You you His love the conversation of aspect of it too, don't you? Oh yeah, yeah. It's definitely... I feel like that's that's a lot of what goes into tattooing. Like you're sitting there, what six hours, seven hours, you know, just getting a tattoo or something. Uh, I try to work in two hour increments, um, maybe three. So yeah, generally a full day, like that would be a whole day tattooing. Um, and over the twenty years, I've learned to just try to break it up into smaller bits if I can physically for my back and stuff, you know, um, it's just part of it, you know, that duration. And then if you get bored or you're in a hurry, that changes the over, you know, the outcome of the artwork too. So there's plenty of times when the person's from somewhere, you know, other than this area. And I do have to put in four or five hours. It's been a while since I've done a six or an eight hour one, but I've tattooed somebody open to close and I got done and he asked me to touch up another tattoo on his other arm. And I was like, fuck you, Scott, I'm <laughs> toast. I didn't, I couldn't feel my finger at my forefinger and my thumb for two weeks. They were just nothing there. It was just numb. What would you say is the most memorable thing you probably heard or a story that was been told you just on the, based on the tattoo that you were giving? The most memorable story from another customer? Just any, anybody that you've come across or with. just like, so, get a tattoo so when people ask me for the story, yeah. um, it's called crazy bitch. And <laughs> Uh, our shop, uh, we had a, we had a pretty large, um, flash room area where a lot of people could fit in, you know, and, and the original shop, our new, our new one's much smaller. And this family came in with this lady who wanted to get two dolphins jumping towards each other, kind of kissing, making a heart shape. So it's a pretty cute tattoo. And I'm looking at the family and like the boyfriend's got a blue mohawk and the daughter's kind of just milling about wishing she could get tattooed. And the dad's kind of kind of pissed like he doesn't want to be there and she's like i wanted to say crazy bitch and i was like cool you know like anything that's not a memorial or taking it so serious sometimes i just want to you know get my fun tat out and have yeah. fun so that was i was wrong it didn't it didn't come out that way <laughs> over the course of tattooing them and the daughter like using up my whole bottle of white out to paint her shoe while i wasn't looking and the like husband hitting on uh the 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 wife kept saying that the boyfriend looked hot and why she should get his nipples pierced. And like the husband kept getting more mad. Come to find out, he tells me blatantly in front of everybody that she cheated on him the week before in a hot tub. And he's back this weekend to, to get his or something like that. You just don't feel comfortable and at I'm that like point. totally out of my element. Yeah, this is maybe only like six or so years into tattooing. And I'm just, you know, blushing basically. And this lady is the crazy bitch. She fuck starts laughing with her smoky cough. <laughs> And it's like she's got them. And so then I'm finished and I had to tell them the healing instructions, which include no hot tubs. And then like poo poo, like the steam comes out of his head and out of his ears and they roll out and leave her there. And we have to get her a cab and just she was perfectly content. And it was just wild. Like, I just can't tell you how much more anxiety there was. I'm already tattooing the person. Like you said, you think that's where the anxiety lies. We never know when the ulterior motives are going to come out. We were trying to focus too. I mean, you're, you're giving, <laughs> it was crazy, man. There's so much going on. I just couldn't even make it up. You're giving a tattoo <laughs> to someone, and you're trying to you're trying to also have fun with yourself, but you're also getting to know the person too because you're oh, yeah. sitting there. You know how probably difficult it is to be giving a tattoo to someone they have their headphones and not talking to you at all. You're sitting there like ironic that you say that. I just got headphones for Christmas, and I've actually been enjoying it. So up until now, I've always been kind of like that's rude, or you know uh how could you concentrate when you can't hear anything else but somehow i tried it on and i haven't actually had a customer that i tattooed with headphones on but as soon as i have a customer that brings their own headphones i'm going to join them but while i'm drawing and stuff i can kind of eliminate you know the shop's smaller so it's noisier and sometimes i just have a hard time focusing you know i'm just trying to draw this little heart with these little music notes but then I can hear the phone ring and then my appointment's canceling and then you know and all that stuff starts happening so now headphones are a dream come true and I'm guessing just because the way we're going with technology now, it's probably changing a little bit. The kind of interpersonal or connection that you would get or intimacy, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. through tattooing is becoming a little bit different just because people are just going to walk in with Bluetooth or something on and be like, I'd rather just listen to a song and have a conversation. You can roll with that. I intentionally got a stereo that had Bluetooth so that people could listen to their band if they were getting a band tat. That's how music oriented I am personally. <laughs> well, well, my hobbies and professions and things I like. I feel music is part of tattooing in that just the same as a tattoo machine in tune is literally in tune, like a guitar's in tune. Mm -hmm. um, the vibrations that it takes to make the tattoos uh, are part of the, of part of, are, is part of what the recipient's getting. 
like we were saying before, that you may not really co comprehend. You don't understand that the pain is from these vibrations, but it's so minimal compared to how good the vibrations are for you. That's partly why you can get through it. Anyone get a little tattoo, you know, it's, it's, uh, there is a feel good part of it. The endorphins, um, you rush to your, um, um, what do you call it? Your immune system gets a boost. You know, it's, it's how warriors were created originally and life's tough. We got to be tougher. You know, that's what tats are for. So, you know, doesn't matter. It looks like a pretty rose. It still means this bitch is bad <laughs> out to that lady, to that guy. That person needs that little bit of effort or not effort. You know, the efforts on my part, but the, it just, it's like a symbol of their resiliency, you know? And so my job is not to be too judgy about what it looks like. I'm not trying to tell you what that looks like. You can tell me. And then when people can't, that's where the long winded conversations come in. And sometimes I chase people away forever, but when they do come back, even with shitty tats, I love it when people come back and they're like, you were right. I got this one. I don't like it. Not like this one, but, but now I know what I want. You got to get some bad tattoos to be able to get really good tattoos. I mean, well, it's just inevitable. So would you say the bad tattoo would be the crazy, <laughs> bitch, the crazy bitch one would be the bad tattoo? Hmm. Not at all. No, bad is just a, it's like a Michael Jackson bad way of looking at it. No, she was set. It worked perfectly. It sewed up her deal. I didn't believe in what she was doing, but I just kind of got sucked into the current, you know, the, uh, yeah. you know, the boat was going by. I just was part of what she was up to. It was like a life lesson of how to, I don't say judge people, but size them up, you know, just as a salesman, just like with any kind of art, we're 24, seven, 365. It's not a job you turn off. So, you know, you have to buy and sell. I'm sorry, not buy and sell like a uh, traditional capitalist would buy a product and sell it. You're actually inventing it or creating it first, then selling it. So you're both the front of the house and the back of the house. You know, you're the factory, you're the production unit, you're your own marketing agent. You know what I mean? It's tough. It's a lot going on. That's why I don't necessarily recommend it to students and people that are artists in general, because there's so much more to it than art, you know. Plus, with just the idea of 24-7, 365, even if you're home, you're still thinking of an idea or being able to work on it. You can't just turn creativity off. You shouldn't. When I do, bad things happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? The energy comes down. If I'm not ready for it, it seems to manifest in other things that force me to do that. You know, that's how I look at it anyway. I just have so many times I'm sitting there like, oh, I'm going to come back to this later. I'm going to do it tomorrow or right. something. And I'll be sitting down and be like, oh, wait. And I'll start going. I'll start scribbling something or doing yeah, something. Yeah, at least take a note. The power of intuition is so so strong, and that's one of the downfalls, I think, of humanity is that we are kind of taught inherently to make everything wait its turn. And what the way that we prioritize things is kind of, you know, I don't know, it could, it could be rat race compared to, you know, like an artist isn't part of the mainstream of things, regardless of how mainstream mainstream wants art to be <laughs> the crazy thing is just with the amount of been doing this podcast and having conversations with people from all over i've started to notice that we all kind of have the same question on our minds the same thing is always that nobody's really having a conversation anymore you know you it's ask true. you ask somebody for an hour you ask somebody for 30 minutes you ask something like this they give you a, a little bit amount of time and then it seems like you're rushing them the whole time yeah. i'm like it's not so hard just to sit and have a conversation to watch where it leads because you start discovering more about a person and through doing this I've not only included in my own life, like going out to the store, creating small chat conversation, but started noticing other people that were starting to have conversations in their own life, just being able to connect again. We're yeah. living in a world where technology is kind of consuming it. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, but it's also like we've never seen this before mm -hmm. and we don't know how to act. So it's so easy to isolate ourselves than rather be more open and comfortable. Right. Yeah. I'm in the last generation of people that never had it. And you're in the first generation of people that have always had it. And, um, at some points we've had it, you know, we don't want to be part of, at some point you have to be part of the natural world. So that's where the bicycling part that I can't really separate from my life comes back into play is on these conversations with people that I was tattooing, inevitably they'd also say something to the effect of what would you rather be doing, which I'd never rather be doing something than tattooing as far as my job goes, but I would rather be riding my bicycle if I didn't have a job like tattooing, you know, you know, it would be second, but like I was saying about trying to keep things out, it becomes even more prevalent because that's the yin and the yang of the world, you know, the way that things work. And um, bicycling provides long extended conversations. That's part, that's the secret. When people are like, well, why do you still do? I mean, all these years you've been riding your bike, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I know it's healthy, but what's the exciting part? And when you go for a bike ride with people, that's what happens. You got all that time to talk. And 
shake things out think different smell the air you know um you know just sharing time like you're saying and, and that's what's important about you know dinners and the way you know people correspond with each other um whether it's handwritten letters or emails um digital or not we kind of have we are shaking that out it's like uh humanity's got speed wobbles right now <laughs> you know what i mean a lot of us are good at hanging on luckily we've all been skating our asses off mountain biking you know most people are fairly athletic and can hang on but those that can't you know they should pull their arms in and go with the flow you know when you claw at the sides of the river of life all you're gonna do is wear out your fingernails so you only get at <laughs> the edge of the bank you're not gonna stop the river of life from flowing you only get this swim type, you only get this type <laughs> of thinking too from doing something like that too because spending more time just with your thoughts in general I think that's where a lot of wisdom comes from too. Right. Just when it comes to even cycling, I mean, when you're outdoors and you're just riding around taking account of what's actually happening in front of you rather than what's happening somewhere else in the world based on just looking at your phone, you start to become more connected and more grounded off as a person where it's able to have a conversation. It's easy it is to have one with you. I mean, for me, I try my best to stay off my phone most of the time. It's more about just trying to set up something right. or, you know, I can't stand the people that text me 12 times right in a row before I even respond. Like, I love the um, old text where you had to hit it three times to even get a letter. Yeah, yeah. But with biking in general, it's a form of expression. I mean, I'm a fitness freak, you know that. And it's like, right. when it comes to having that connection, first of all, either being able to just ride off and do whatever you want or be able to mm -hmm. kind of get into a conversation, you start finding out more things and get into deeper connections with people too, which is, I think, it needs to be a main thing that needs to be brought back. Because not a lot of people want to do that. Right. They're like, oh, I want to ride my bike outside. Yeah, it's a... It's a part of self-awareness and preparedness you know also as a commuter when you leave on your bike to go to work if you forget something you're kind of screwed you're not turning back around again yeah. if it takes you half an hour to get to work or for me it's almost an hour um i just invested in an e-bike because of that the safety concerns that i had and uh everything else i'd love to just be able to ride my bike but where we're at cars and trucks rule the roads and they're not backing down they're telling people like me to put on more fluorescent stuff or just stop doing it around here anyway you know um i just had the so, other day i was driving on right over the ocean pines bridge and a dude didn't even look he just went right in front of me with his bike and i i just honked i was like dude and he you know hey, well we have to look out for each other i mean that's yeah. the thing the way is for everyone and that's what i love about ski like uh part of skiing snowboarding and uh you know just the idea that the person in front of you has the right of way uh is kind of a lost art in itself you know Allow, making yourself second is similar to being Christian or uh, religious in that it's much more difficult. Yeah. And at this point in time, everyone's just flooring it. <laughs> Wait, you're getting ready to get out there? Just Every, floor past you. Rush, everybody's yeah. in a rush. I told him. I was well, like, that's intentional because everything's also disposable. And if we don't ruin enough stuff fast enough and throw it away, then the powers that be won't make their half a percent on their 401k, you know. That's where we're at. I, I just should have told <laughs> that him, I was like, it. man, I, I could have hit you. And he just looked at me. He's like, I'm sure. he's like, I'm sorry. I'm like, dude, it's yeah. cool. I'm just saying. No, I'm both. I have a brand new truck that can't go under 25 miles an hour. So I'm in fear of running someone over. And I am a biker whose fear is fear is being that's my end game. At least he died doing what he loved, riding his bike underneath of a truck. You know what I mean? Like, how's that? You know, that's not really great. So that's why I'm putting so much effort into uh, the not just like trying to change the laws, but educating people on getting interested in it, becoming more of a civic person. I just wasn't when I was in high school. I thought I was too cool for it, I suppose. You know, I was more worried about what I looked like. And yeah, uh, ride a bike with a helmet. Even though I was punk rock, I was, I've always felt more of a poser. And when I found bicycling in this area to be so difficult, so I rode my bike forever in Ocean City. And then when I moved to Ocean Pines, I didn't. And then once the kids were old enough to be ridden to school, I mean, our school's within two miles. It's right there. Um, it was dangerous. Apparently, times had changed. And so since then, in addition to my tattooing, I just can't help but worry about every person I see riding their bike. Any person who can't even that has a bike that can't ride it. You know, we're at a point where there's more bikes than people riding them. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, it it's like, you know, what's the point of having bikes? People can't ride them. And so. Um, similarly with the trails, the point of that was more so that you could find a place to ride your bike that didn't include cars and make destinations that would then become places that people would ride their bike to. So I could create a situation for commuters by having destinations where bike parks exist, places that people can ride their bike free of cars. And, um, my main goal is to make, you know, is for ocean city to embrace that, you know, 
to slow down the traffic and make the cars hold still better <laughs> so that pedestrians can walk around and enjoy the sights and not have to worry about getting run over. You know? It kind of seems like you consider this like a like your mission in a way too. Like right. How did you get to that point? Just for, just worrying about other people? I guess my parents and everything, you know, the way I was raised, I've always been open and aware of, um, you know, people that don't have it as good as you do. So growing up, I had two guys that moved into my house when I was uh, uh, 16 until uh, I was 18. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I, it just found me. Like I said, that's the dilemma with trying to shut stuff out, you know. One of my joke, my tattoo jokes about the cover ups is I can only make it look different. I can't make you forget what it is. Only hard drugs and alcohol can do that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the problem. We're in it. We're coming out of this purple haze since the year I was born, 1968, where drugs and alcohol have gotten us this far. And now what? Now everyone's sobering up and looking at the reality of what we got left. We got a planet that's starting to melt and snowboarders that are just like, you know, what am I doing? I'm snowboarding on ice crystals that these guys squirted all over this hill. Look at all this wasted water. Is this wasted water? Is this good for the planet? We don't know. We don't know what we're doing. Well, I you know? I made up this thing. I said that, you know, the earth is like is like a person's skin. There's only a certain amount of tattooing that you can do. And then eventually there's no more space to put anything. And that's kind of what we're doing with pollution and everything, too. I don't think yeah. anybody really realizes how much global warming is actually happening. I mean, I've talked to people that are in you know, near Antarctica and stuff that are working and digging up fossils. And they're like, it's amazing because now the glaciers are melting so we can actually find the fossils easier. That's but true. like, there's a main, yeah, yeah, but there's a main concern there too when it comes to the rest of the world. Like it being like 60 or 70 degrees in January when we're supposed to be doing a little sure. bit colder than that. Once again, it's that kind of a different way of looking at yourself, uh, making yourself second and making sure that, look at the way that uh, wolves uh leave one area and go to the next you know the leaders in the back you know you have the strong dogs in the front you have all the moms and the babies in the middle and then you have the best dogs towards the back and then the last wolf is the leader of the pack you know that's how life on this planet has to evolve or it will just it'll just start over again like it has in the past i mean those same guys are finding more evidence that says this has happened before you know planet gets hot I would say less like skin and more like a dog's back. We're just fleas on a dog's back. Mother yeah. Earth's just going to shake us right off. And there's been, you know? there's been periods. It's happening as yeah. we speak. I mean, on the news right now, Philippines, boom. There's been periods you of know? time where the Earth's already reset itself a couple right. of times and knocked off whatever was on here. The problem is the guys that are in charge, uh, you know, so to speak, um, rely on the fear of that and keep people down so it's not a pool of success we're still using the ladder the idea that you have to step on somebody else to get up there and you have to or you have to convince people to hold the ladder so that you can stand up there well that's, that's, you know, that's still if the, the person would just today. come back down from their high heights <laughs> so that's you know what i love about snowboarding and skiing is i need to get up there but i want it to be in reality that's not disneyland i just dislocated my right shoulder having too much fun in reality that's not going to happen playing a video game yeah. maybe you fall out of your chair and dislocate your shoulder. Sure. Probably in a college dorm, some kid being pushed down the hallway in his chair. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. has happened. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not against that side of it either. I don't want to, you know, you know, I'm just saying that, you know, tattooing is a very real reality and that's what people love about it is it's a, it's a, a marker. It's a way like the earth, we were saying the earth needs to, to somehow restart itself. You know, when we do a FTW tattoo, it doesn't mean fuck the earth. It's the world that we've created. Yeah. Fuck this shit. This could be better. Everything that's here, someone thought of, someone imagined. That's what the song's about. Everything we have now, someone imagined. So if we can, if we imagine that it's not good, then we should stop imagining it altogether and imagine what could be better. And like you were saying about the skin thing, just as you can imagine, once someone has their whole body tattooed, they couldn't get another one. There's a guy getting his whole arm blacked out on top of that or screen door. We call it like, you know, you get a, another wild looking thing over top of the tattoo that you have. You know, that's the difference between optimism and, and not so optimism. You know, there's, I don't see an end to any idea and um, makes things more difficult sometimes. But I'd rather, you know, regret something I did do, something I did say or something I tried than to uh, remain silent and be thought a fool, you know, kind of thing. You know, I just don't see the point in going down with some ideas that could have been, could have made somebody else happy. 
Well, you yeah, think of yeah. you think of all these people that try and do local, you know, eat local, do things locally, you know, help create communities that are local to help kind of progress, I guess, the sure. earth into a better future. That's the same thing you're doing. Yeah. Everyone thinks like, oh, my small act, my small trash is not going to do anything at all. It really certainly does. Up. Like even with the fact that you're able to do all these community events, also still be in touch with people in a business aspect too, with tattooing, right. helping them decide what they want. You're still providing a lot. And you this is where your kind of mindset is because you're around people like 24-7. You're never not really around them. You know right. Like, I mean, oh, yeah. When the when a tattoo, gets, tattoo shop gets slow, that is tough it's torture when there's no one to talk to other than ourselves because even a lot you know, of times like, ah! <laughs> yeah, even a lot of times you might be like super busy do another like, painting yeah, yeah. Like, think put that's what happens then you focus those ideas whatever we're somewhat you know i don't want to say complaining but in general whatever's the that's it's the good stress the stress of creating this painting is going to alleviate that stress of listening to what's ne- what's on the news right now whether it's for bad or for worse whether somebody just got struck by a tornado and they need help you know, we, that's why we do a lot of fundraisers. So I can not only feel like I've done my part, but just show people what they can just show them how easy it is to just chip in, just do it. You know, and so that's, that's what the saying means. Like, um, I just feel like there's this veil of, oh, I couldn't be a part of that or I couldn't do that or I don't have time, basically. You know, my, it's one of my other jokes when I meet someone like minded like yourself. I'm like, oh, you're the guy that has all the free time. <laughs> my time's not free. No one's is. But. It's also not that expensive or is it, you know, that's your choice to make. That's the choice you have, you know, is how can you make yourself more available? And that's what I want my sons to learn is, you know, you can always make yourself more available, even though you, especially when you don't think so. As soon as you have that thought, that's what I've been trying to, that's my, uh, how can I put it? That's like the marker flags, you know, when I build a trail, I don't want to have too many signs that tell the person where to go or how to get there. But they want to see them so that they know where they're going and how to get there. They send golf into a tree or something. Right. Figuratively, when I have the emotional feeling that I am fed up with the idea, I can't stand it, whatever negative thing, that's when I, that's when you absolutely have to remember that that's the opening. That's the window opening. You're looking out now. Now you're listing all the reasons that you can do it, not the reasons you can't do it. You're striking stuff off the list. You're finally getting a clear thought. And then if you get interrupted by a text, if you just turn on the boob tube and watch TV, you don't take a note of that. Well, it'll come back to you. It'll come down from the, you know, the one song that goes through the universe, you know. But if you don't wait, if you do know, if you can just remember to step back and wait for those, then you're a better ball player. You know what I mean? Then you're ready for what's happening in the world. And that's that's why I'm using bicycle as a metaphor for life. You know, you have to make sure there's air in the tires, the brakes work and the chains on there. Yeah. Right. People leave their house, don't even have their seatbelt on yet, still trying to finish a text, lighting a cigarette. It's like, can you just get all that together before you drive this 40,000 person a year killing machine down the street? I mean, cars kill 40,000 people a year easily. Bikes don't do that. You know what I mean? Do you think it's going to continue to go this way, though? Because I see like Mm -hmm. we see some change, but it's not really like I feel like it's like we're saying with the earth a little bit, too. It's going to take to a point where. It's too late and there's nothing we can really do, like kind of irreversible damage like we've already done. But the yeah. whole factor is like we're not going to be able no. to stop it at all. But that's when people are going to turn around and be like, oh, we need to fix it. It's like, sorry, yeah. you're already, we're already in red we should, zone. Yeah. Well, it's the difference. Should I ride my bike now or when I have to? You know what I'm saying? It's just like working out. Should I work out now or when the doctor tells me I'm obese? That's Each one of us is smart enough to know the answer, but we're not have we don't have the time to we don't think clearly about our life well enough to make that the priority well, you know people have just, the time they just put, don't want exactly to that's my point about you and i are the ones with the free time right now yeah. everyone else has to go to work well then we go to work yeah everybody has to make their money the way they have to make it that's a paradigm shift there's too many people and not enough jobs so there has to be more answers to fixing that problem and that creates a problem to me not just more industry not going back to burning coal uh, you know, that's not, you know, that's, yeah. okay, I can go on and on about that. We're using, part. we're using brand new technology, but we're thinking still in the old times. We're still thinking, we're not right. thinking with it yet. We're not sure. thinking in the beneficial Well, way. just like your phone, the newer your phone is, the better update you can get. When people have old phones, they can't get the update. So then you can't send them the emoji that you want to send them in the morning. And that takes you off your whole day. Hey, that explains, I mean, that ex- that explains hypothetically speaking, perfectly. it's never happened to me. <laughs> when I send a sad face or when I send a poop emoji, people know I'm being serious. Right. But, you know, if the one guy that you like the most just refuses to update their phone, 
then they get an alien face or a box with an X in it or an empty box or a box with a question mark, you know. That's what that means? Yeah, that means they haven't updated their uh, OS. I had no idea. I was getting a bunch of those. I was like, what is this question mark box thing? As far as I know, I'm not that intelligent or, uh, well, I'm not very IT oriented. And, um, but that's what I've, that's another one of those ways of looking at it. I was the guy that kept being confounded by technology. I'm just going to embrace it. Each time it pisses me off, I'm going to take an extra minute to try to learn what that was and remember how it worked and where that setting was. For, you know, mostly right now, we've got iPads, the tattoo shop, and we're using Procreate to draw people's drawings. And now when people walk in, we're electronically receiving the picture. So it used to be they would hold it up and shove it in my face, which was like not my not fun. You know, I didn't like for some reason that just came off weird. Now, when people walk in and show me the picture, I ask them if they have airdrop and they airdrop it to me and I put it on the iPad and we just start getting to work and we're not wasting any paper. We're not wasting any time, you know what I mean? And and I'm not getting pencil all over the edge of my hand and smearing it and redrawing it and getting frustrated by that. I'm using technology in a more beneficial way than something like reading what Trump wrote on Twitter or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In between reading what that's Trump a wrote that's on a Twitter. better way of where to take tech, technology and stuff. Like I use it to set up something. I use it to call something. Oh man, the, the whole fact like tweeting, poking, all that type of stuff, all the stuff that we're spending half the time scrolling through our phone rather than actually seeing what we're not even taking in the information. It's no. just something for our eyes to look at. You know, Agreed. I keep my phone in the car when I go to the grocery store. The whole aspect is I don't want a million texts going off because it's going to turn that 30 minute, 20 minute, whatever trip into a 45 minute to an hour or something. Sure. I, you know, that's just I guess that's what I'm getting at is when it would it offend you that someone doesn't know how to find your tattoo shop because they're asking for directions on the phone. Just be nice to give them the directions. Don't act like they should know how to use their maps on their phone. They just don't yet. And half the time, the GPS takes them to a cornfield down the street from our tattoo shop, and they still have to call. So neither one's perfect. None of us are perfect. So if we can, you know, as my wise wife said to me just yesterday, people aren't always going to talk to you the way you want them to. And so I, I want to remember that. You know what I mean? I almost want to get it tattooed on me. That's where why tattoos are so prevalent in that regard. It's like a bow on your finger. The thing, the whatever it is, the uh, event. The time of the, you know, the thing that you're trying to immoralize, uh, memorialize is life changing. And so isn't it funny that something that's so permanent and can't change or at least, you know, relatively speaking, tattoos don't change too much when, you know, you get after you get them. It's representing something that you never want to let change. And then here we are talking about how we must change. The only thing in life that's that we know for sure is that it will change. So that's why it's what? the dot in the center of one of the sides. You pick the side, black or white, you know? <laughs> I definitely think change is good. I think most people are trying to forget the past. But I think that's the good part about tattoo, too. Is oh, it's yeah. a great thing to move forward. Like, you right. know what I mean? Like, when you get a tattoo of something that happened in your life, such as, like, yeah. someone passing or something. It's literally a stop sign in the road of life. Yep. Yeah. You just stop there. You take a pause. And then, just like a great song, you can look down at it and remember it again. And that's what it, that's what it's all about. You know, those memories become fleeting. The older you get, the softer your brain gets, the less it remembers all the cool details. And so whether it's the cool details that Dana put in the hair of the dog that my our buddy Chris did originally, um, or the fact that it represents protecting my family. And that's kind of me in my life sleeve, you know, um, that's the difference that people that don't get tattoos, I'd like to say, you know, people without tattoos make people with tattoos special. There's no reason why you have to get them. I don't want to deal with that question or answer for that person. That's the one thing that just throws me a curveball. And like I was saying originally, it makes me feel like they're just trying to get out of it. You know, they just want to say that they did try, but the guy wasn't, you know, capable of thinking of the idea, drawing it the way I wanted it to look. You know, that's probably one of your best aspects as a tattoo artist, just being able to read people pretty well, too. I would say you read people. I recommend it to anyone becoming yeah. an artist. Uh, you know, I mean, you a, can tell when you're shooting off an idea and someone's just like, eh, I want it this way. And you're like, oh, and you're trying to read it off of them as well. You're trying yeah. to be able to. And I can tell if they're sincere or not. Yeah. And you but sometimes tell. people say it just to get another idea. I'm like, nah, that's not how this works. And you can tell at <laughs> the time, like someone comes in with an idea, you got to figure out how would you put that on that person? How would you make it look like something that they're going to enjoy when they get it done? Like, oh, that's an exactly. amazing tattoo. And I'd want to continue sitting next to them and having a longer conversation. Yeah. Because that's what happens with the tag. They got to sit next to you. I mean, I'm on top of the person. There's what other jobs is like that, you know? 
the dentist is finished quicker than we are. Yeah. <laughs> Doctors are, you know, don't usually take that long. Or if they are, they knock you out. <laughs> There's no conversation there. You know, the dentist tries to talk to you as soon as he puts his hands in your mouth. That's not a conversation. Yeah. So it is kind of rootsy in that way. It's one of the original occupations that there are. You know, I, I worked think- for the chief next to the medicine man. and We made sure that the warriors were ready for battle. I'm starting to see a lot of flashback kind of come back with a lot of old crafts in a way, like wood carving. Um, yeah, wood burning. Bakery. I love You've it. seen a lot of people get into just home bakes in general. Just right. the idea of having when you have a little bit of time when you're not at work, you never want to really leave the house, but you still want to find something that is a good passion or something to go after, such as we're seeing cycling happen now, too. Right. And I think it's shifting, like, you know how our cell phones went from super big to super small or now to super big again to where you can't even fit them mm-hmm. in your jeans. And it's like we're seeing a whole throwback kind of come back. I'm seeing this come with, like, I hope more people are going to be tattoo artists. Would you recommend that? I feel like, you know, you said it earlier. You know, just like on a business aspect, it's not as great for the person who's been doing it like myself because it just saturates the market. So you just make less money. But if you're seeing better tattoos, for sure, you know, as an apprentice my or as a as a master tattooer, I guess you could say I, don't, I still consider myself an apprentice. Nonetheless, our apprentice, the person that I would take on, I would my plan would be to make them better than me, of course, you know, and uh, the best way to get your apprenticeship is to start getting tattoos. If you're not willing to get tattooed, you shouldn't be trying to do them. You know, I thought it may be kind of old school. Um, and I love when people come in now. I used to hate it. But when people come in and show me the tattoo they did on themselves, I admire it for what it is and try to keep an open mind that, you know, maybe they'll become a tattooer. Probably not because there's just so many more things to it than just drawing. It's not drawing. You know, anybody, anybody, you know, drawing and the art part of it is what's important about it. The tattooing is just a process. You know, it's just I can teach you to tattoo, you know. Would you consider doing more like research would be kind of important when it comes to doing a tattoo or just the idea of getting the experience for someone that's trying to do tattoos? It's all the above. You know, I have an ironic situation where um, I'm kind of a... um, like 22 is my lucky number. I have to say I'm a bit of an anomaly. So most of the tattooers I know uh, struggled, really, you know, had to struggle to get in there and figure out a way to become a tattooer. I happened to be invited, you know, as the screen printer, I was making the t-shirts the old fashioned way, right when computers were taken over. I knew that the screen printing was becoming antiquated, but I could cut ruby lith and amber lith, which is the way you make the color separations, each color on the t-shirt you photograph the outline and I had a stat camera in a dark room with chemicals. And then you come out with your line art on a clear film and on a light table, you lay a red layer over it and it's not even a millimeter thick. And it's uh, like a gelatin on the surface and a um, acetate film on the back. And you had to use a razor blade and cut the red part off. And everywhere that you peeled that out, you would photograph again and that would become black. And then the black part of that was the yellow or the red or the blue or the green in each. And you had to do that for each color that the T-shirt was going to be printed. And so these guys that were tattooers are watching me cut these color separations like, yeah, fuck yeah, dude. If you can do that, you can easily tattoo. It's what the person wants to get and what it looks like that's more the issue. You know what I mean? And that goes back to like the couch thing. There's tattooers that just have an aesthetic. You like their designs. You buy them. You get them. You do it. You don't tell them what to do. You don't change it very much. but then there's guys that like I do, which is kind of create it from scratch and try to embrace what the person's looking for in style and technique and the theme. You know, like I said, that's the hardest part. When people just don't have a theme yet, you know, you have to get to know them like it's the first date. I'm literally asking the person what their favorite color is, what kind of flowers they like, you know, you like sports, <laughs> you know, yeah. and um, that's the lost art part. That's the conversational side that. I don't feel like I'm wasting my time, but I know folks that do. It's probably hard for you to get into something that's like someone wants this exactly done that way because you have no free kind of creativity. Like it's got to be good to put it on them, but like someone's just picking out a random design out of a book. You're like, yeah, but do you want that? Or do you want to, you know, I could see you branching off and giving someone the idea just because you have this whole creative side to you with the amount of stuff. That that's the hard create. part. You have to really you just get it's all about the timing. Like sometimes that is the best way to do it. Just spare the moment, knock it out. You know, and I'm a street tatter in that regard. I love doing walk-ins. I don't want to think about it. It's not my tat. I just want to do the thing, you know? So there's plenty of times where <clears throat> the person doesn't need to put as much effort. It's more automatic, you know? And that's how life is. Sometimes it's like a river. Sometimes it's running fast. Sometimes it's running slow. 
you have to do both. You can't be choosy about the river. Uh, although mankind does, you know, my other uh, analogy I like to use is called the chair. So man needs to sit down. So he builds a chair and he builds a, you know, folding chair and a long chair that's padded and a recliner. Dude never sits down. You know, the point was man needs to sit down. And we just don't do that. We and start our mind starts racing with these ways that we can make sitting down better for the world and everyone. And it's important to do both. You know, it's important to inspire other people to do that. And it's also important to participate when people are doing that. And that's kind of, I think, where we're at, where there's a lot less participating in other people's things. That's why I reached out to you. I really wanted to participate in what you were doing. That's what makes me happy. And, um, then there's the other way around where the person just comes in, tells me their tat story and they want me to participate as if I, I give two shits, you know, yeah. and uh, I can always tell when the person's insincere about it because they just don't remember my name, you know, yeah. and then I got to remember, shit, I'm terrible at remembering names. And it's and, and everything starts and then they leave and then the next person comes in and it starts all over again. And I might not remember theirs. They might not remember mine. But then maybe that's not the point, you know, the point is the time spent is the journey. And then that goes back to the bicycling ocean city, great destination, Berlin, you know, you know, coolest town in the world or whatever. Um, these are destinations are clean and beautiful and, and have some bike racks occasionally. And now more than ever, but the commute between nothing dangerous, Dude, scary. That's so a- that's where I'm stuck. I can only, I can't, I can't just keep riding past all of these problems. I have to slow down look for other people that are noticing it and then say, Hey, look, let's have a meeting. And that's the hardest part, getting people to meet together and become organized. So I'm a community organizer. Well, that's the era. I too. use the tattoos as a means of community organizing. I use the bikes as a means to community organize. We're heading in an era right now where it's kind of like health style, all these life fitness, you know, diet plans, all these changes and stuff. You see a lot more bike racks everywhere just because more people are being active. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a welcome sign. If you don't have a bike rack at your store, you're not smart. <laughs> but I think every, everybody thinks of it as the physical change is what the health thing I'm talking about. I see it in a whole different perspective. I see an emotional, mental, basically fix. Mm-hmm. It Oh, it's proven by science. It's a stress reliever. And the whole factor yeah. is it's a community builder as well. Like you were saying, the whole aspect is as people, you know, like you, you said, you mentioned before with communication, the whole idea was that someone just needs to get something from somebody or go or step on someone's throat or get up to whatever just mm-hmm. to get what they want. It's all people want anymore. Everybody right. wants to be famous. Everybody wants to do this. Everybody wants to be known. Every nobody wants to leave this earth without a mark on it. Whether it's something that you built, whether it was something someone one person remembering your name. Yeah, so, you know, I can say the same thing. I, mean, I, I think there is. Them. We just don't know because that's how we feel. We, we want to make our mark. You know, we want to get there, and that's the thing. You got to remember, look over your shoulder and notice the people that might be remaining quiet but aren't not doing anything. You know, extremely influential people don't make a peep. <laughs> they don't say anything. Because once you get to a point, that's what you understand is, you know, talking makes you feel more comfortable. It's noise in the room, you know, you know, having a conversation is great. If we just sat here for this long and didn't talk at all, you know, you got to pay extra for that. That's, that's yoga. That's therapy. <laughs> that's like, oh, another thing. playing rock, paper, scissors. After like five there minutes. you go. Right, right. Otrio. That's a new game that we got. That's pretty fun. Like tic-tac-toe from Sweden. Mm-hmm. And of course, t- playing records. You know, my natural reaction is always to make some kind of music. Um, I feel like vibrations are everything it's healing. And that's where tattooing is my, is that's how I can put good vibrations back into the world. You know, it's very rare. I've done any kind of tattoos that are, um, vindictive and, uh, because I, it just doesn't happen to me. I'm just not open to that generally. So it has to be a trick like the crazy bitch. It, It has to be like, I was mistaken when I thought that this was for fun. It really is a vindictive tattoo. And they're out there, you know, whether it's as blatant as a swastika or the guy getting attacked because his wife said no or the wife getting attacked because the dude said no. You know what I mean? That's there's always that part of the tattooing for me that, you know, I don't worry about as much as I used to in my, you know, getting older with tattooing. I just am trying to take people for face value, give them a high quality product as fast as I can make it, you know. Giving people that option to actually be good, you know, not both ways. Yeah, I can do it now and it's going to be good or we can make it take longer. It's fine. Whichever way they want to go. You know, I'm I'm for both. (laughs) It's just hard to manage. I meant the more good side about the experience and having them there. You know what I mean? Trying to see them for like, oh, you'll definitely pay me or you'll definitely do this. Being able to actually, you know, have that 
faith in humanity type act. Yeah, that's my jaw. Jaw will provide. I have to have faith in uh, uh, Philip Liu is a tattooer that I admire. And his dad, Felix, told him, you set the price and you do the work. Simple as that. So we do a lot of hourly rate because we don't know how to set the price when something's extremely detailed, large, or in a odd place, you know, where it's going to be hard to reach. Um, but that's part of setting the price. Either we tell you it's going to be one way or the other. And then that way you're comfortable knowing where we're going with that. And Hey, if it takes longer, I don't mind. You know what I mean? If it's going to look better, that's cool. But sometimes, you know, people add stuff at the last minute, do things that are a little herky jerky, um, comes with the territory, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's all part of tattooing. You never know what you're going to get. What would you say the longest tattoo probably there is to do? I'm guessing the back is just so big. Um, I mean, in my reading, the Phoenix is the appropriate tattoo for a, um, I want to say Japanese, Chinese, Korean or whatever. But like if you're in the Asian style of tattooing, traditional tattooing, and you're being raised by another tattooer who you are representing their family's way then the Phoenix is the most elaborate, most colorful tattoo that you can do. And that's kind of, uh, from what I understand, the jump off. So generally, you never leave that family and tattoo anywhere else or do much else as far as tattooing. You learn the way the master tattooer did them and you continue that tradition because that's the way you were taught. And it's a little different than America. You know, I'm going to do it my way, you know, kind of thing. It's a lot different. And um but both ways, ironically, that same tattoo generally is one of the most elaborate things you can do to somebody. So anytime you see a little phoenix that's kind of, and I'm not talking about a phoenix that's on fire, that's an American Indian uh, or, or Native American, I should say, tattooing. Uh, as far as I know, the bird on fire phoenix isn't necessarily Asian so much as more like a peacock. They say it's the bird of auspicious occasions. So your whatever 16th birthday or whatever is really important to you might be the, you know, I guess if it's a, a full back piece, it might take over the course of several years, you know, um, generally the bigger they are, the, the more that's all the person does. You know, when you get into the bigger work, you know, I, I like doing big, big stuff, but um, it's really on the customer. The more often they can come back and the more time they can spend. You know, I'm trying to tattoo your whole body, I like to say. <laughs> Some people get a little tats. I'm like, we're just going to get to know each other better. It's going to take longer, but it's fine by me. <clears throat> uh, I don't want to say it's like wasteful. You use less products or, you know, you don't use the needles and stuff for as long. Yeah, I think it's going to be hard to see. I mean, you can, only pour out, you can only pour out so little amount of ink. Yeah. You have to put enough in the cup to be able to dip the needles in the cap to get the needle wet with the ink to make the tat. So if you're only doing a dot, you still have all that ink in the cap. You're not putting it back in the bottle. Well, even like you were saying, your jack of all trades kind of, first of all, naming off the different styles and stuff too. Yeah. There's Asian or Native American. Do you find that you have to kind of look up some of the stuff too and once you're able to kind of figure out like... Yeah, for sure. It's definitely uh, the downside is I will use a lot more reference than if I was making it up my own personal style raised by, like I said, I was born in Dundalk and Essex. And my parents, my dad was a hot rodder and all that. So I'm, you know... I'm really into like uh, hot rod, old school hot rod art and stuff. And the uh, rat fink with the bulging eyes is almost always something I'm going to draw. And I try to, I try to refrain from it just because it's not everybody's style, uh, like the beatnik kind of thing. Um, but, and a little bit airbrushy for some reason. I never got into airbrush, but I like the way that looks. You know, I like the softer kind of looking stuff. Then I don't actually in turn get them. I get more traditionally hard outline tattoos. And so, you know, I myself, like I said, I'm a, I'm, I'm a bit of a like 22, you know, I go back and forth between the two and just try to, uh, like I said, I have to use more reference to be able to do many different styles. And at this point in tattoo history, people are being extremely original and just drawing stuff right on. And, you know, everybody uses some kind of, uh, reference as far as the ideas, um, well, even with that one tattoo you're showing me with Mothman, like yeah, even yeah, just he already... seeing that in general, like you look at that, you'd be like, we could turn this into something that's animated, or we could turn it into something that is real, real realistic, something you would see, like if it was sure. like, a picture taken. Like, how do you? Oh yeah, they're on there. Out? When we googled it, every he because this is the one he of all the pictures that we were looking at and consultating before his walk in. The one that he liked the most, I just didn't question it. I didn't look at all the other ones. I didn't say, what about all these other ones? I didn't even give him that option. He had already said, 
my name is Dean and this is a walk-in. So that means put my opinion aside and dial in this guy's tat, you know? And I looked at his other tats and I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to blow those out the door. And do you mind if I use a little bit thicker needle? My, you know, even though it's not that thick, it's going to be thicker than your other ones. And when I got done, he was like, yeah, that's a real tattoo, you know? <laughs> Have you ever noticed that like, you see people walking around and you can kind of tell like that tat, tat, tattoo does not fit on you? You know what I mean? Like it, sometimes you see someone with like, uh, let's say like you were saying. like, Yeah, it works both ways. I mean, sometimes people get them when they're young and grow out, grow their body physically gets so much bigger. The tattoo's not in the same place anymore. Yeah, see, that makes it difficult when someone gets like, <laughs> near their elbow because the whole pack of the stretching aspect of it, like you're bending your elbow constantly. Does that not stretch the skin, make it kind of warped out a little bit? I get to, I, yeah, you know, you figure that into it. So you wouldn't want to do a beautiful woman's face, generally speaking, in your armpit, on your leg, you know, or on your elbow. Well, Robin, it's going to distort her face. Robin, you know what I mean? Robin, and you know how I learned that. Robin Williams has that joke. He said, um, when you're like in your 20s or whatever, women, when you get a tattoo, a tramp stamp, whatever you want to call it, of a, a sunset on your ass, he goes, by the time you're 40 or 50, it's an octopus hugging a starfish. Like the age factor plays into a lot of things. That and the person changes their mind. I've done that almost, I, almost exactly where the person wanted to impress their loved one. They got his name, plural, across their back. That didn't work. So then they came in and I did octopus tentacles covering up the name and wrapping around and it was uh a little sexual it had like ropes and she was tied up a bit so it was, it was interesting wait you're telling me ken and barbie isn't forever <laughs> there's no forever there's no always yeah. but uh, i was gonna make the point of the how you learn by getting tattooed so my third tattoo i wanted a statue of liberty uh pin up um justin weatherholtz was kind of just getting started and his portfolio portfolio looked really good and i said just draw it up and the you know the only thing that i regret was that i put it on my leg which was not his choice and now i if i don't shave my leg she's hairy you know and so i point that out to people i don't go around complaining that justin did something wrong <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. i go around talking about how i mean i use it as a stepping stone for my own life you know that's kind of like the bicycling and the conversations and the whole thing is so many people just won't take responsibility for the choices they've made or lack of. I mean, for that matter, just not making any choices is also a choice. Or making an excuse. That look right. It's, happen. it's being, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I can't remember the word for it. Um, but when you just try to stay ambiguous, eventually more is going to happen to you. It's part of life. That's the way it is. As above, so below, you know. And you can try too hard. I did that snowboarding and dislocated my shoulder. I was having so much fun. I went too far. I just did. You know, I just freaking had a blast. And when I fell down, didn't even hurt when I fell down. I just couldn't get up very easily. Mm -hmm. My shoulder was out. So, you know, I could say I could have gone and sued the Camelback, I guess. I mean, you know, I could make it as bad as I wanted, but I didn't. I went to the hospital, took care of it. I'm going to meet my insurance agent later. And I luckily can still tattoo. You know? Yeah. I think it's riding like, my bike's a little more difficult. Yeah, it's what they no, What is it? No regrets, right? That tattoo and someone getting no regrets and it's spelled mm -hmm. out no regrets. I've been known to spell some stuff wrong. Uh, one of the first things I would tell any young person getting into tattooing or an artist that's talking about it or whatnot, I'll point that out right away. I'm not embarrassed to say that I didn't. What do you do at that, that point? I, more, you fix it. You make it. You make it right. How do you fix it. You spell <laughs> something wrong though. That's the magic, brother. Like it's the same magic to fit. Everything's like that. That's how we feel all the time. It doesn't matter if there is a mistake or not. Our stomach's in our mouth. You know, we're always worried that the person's not going to like it. We're always thinking that's a possibility that the person could pass out, fall over, get a phone call that changes their life. I mean, I had a lady talking to a, her. Her husband died. She'd only been married to him for a year. She hadn't seen him since he was 18. That guy's ex-wife was on the phone. And they were screaming at each other. And every time I tried to stop, she made me tattoo her. I tattooed his name on her three different ways. I knew none of that was going to fix anything. There was no one else in the shop, really. So it wasn't affecting the overall, you know, vibe. Yeah. But I couldn't wait for her to leave. You know, it was not. That wasn't what I had expected that day. And, you know, so that's where the phones, the technology, you know, I wish people would turn them off and pay attention to me, you know. Yeah. And then when they do, sometimes I will get annoyed because... They're not asking me questions. They're telling me stuff, you know, and, you know, I, there's times when I can talk and there's times when I can't. 
and I can't tell you when they're going to be. So that's where I've been with a lot of my customers. Like, look, I'm still doing the outline. You can keep talking. I, I understand you want to, but I can't right the second. And then as soon as I say that, somehow magically I'm more comfortable and I'm like, yeah. So anyway, and they're probably looking at me like, what a dick. That's just, <laughs> so I call it dig dank. If I dig danked you, I apologize. Sometimes I just have to have it my way right that second. And then once I get through that, it's back to you. You know, cameras are on, you know, but for some reason, there's parts of a tattoo that are so difficult in a way we can't explain whether we think the stencil is going to disappear or can't get the line quite right. You know, we're, we're, you're concentrating. Like when you're looking yeah, there's so many those... decisions happening simultaneously that trying to answer a question becomes difficult. Well, when you're looking for like a house or something, you turn the radio down, you're concentrating yeah, more. It's exactly. exactly like that. You mm -hmm. just need like, let me get through this real quick and then we can have back to this discussion. Which is what I thought about headphones until I got some. And now I'm like, wow, this is actually making it easier to concentrate because I can focus on what I'm doing. I'm not worried about what uh, someone else in the room thinks about this song or these lyrics or like this artist. Well, you're trying you to know, get me. I don't like when people get criti criticized or critiqued. Uh, sometimes I take it personal, I guess. You know, that's the thing I'm trying to get over is not everything that people say is really directed towards me as a person, you know? They're just talking to talk, you know, yeah. and you got to let people. And I think that's the hard part of conversation is if your ego takes over, you want it to be about specific things and then you might miss out on something cool. Yeah. I mean, this is all about the story too. I mean, the fact I, when I do this, I mean, you don't know how many times I'm just sitting here, you know, just talking to someone and just, they're just going off. I mean, for 30 minutes on end, I'm like, let me get, you know, let me, let me cut in here you realize that when they're having a conversation, they don't get that all the time. Sometimes mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I consider like you go to a therapist or something. The only reason a lot of people go to therapists anymore, not only to fix a problem, but the really what they're just trying to do is they just want to have a conversation. They just want to let that stimulate off. I said, with the whole factor of the cell phones is we don't eat dinners anymore. You know, there's not a whole bunch of families out there that are eating dinner seven times a week or three times a week. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's taking up to their yeah, room. I mean, we don't know, you know, like you said, it's your, it's that, that's our, that's my take on it because my hours are during our my business hours are during dinner time. So my kids are home for dinner, then I can't be there for them. And I kind of, that is a regret I have. But the reason that it happened was my dad left at four o'clock in the morning or got up at you know four o'clock in the morning to leave for work before I even got up for school. And we get up same as anybody at six o'clock in the morning. So there you go. That's the yin and the yang. I'm the white dot. He's the black dot, or vice versa. What I learned from him and changed just became different. It's still the same, <laughs> you know, yeah. but I'm stoked that I'm here in the morning when they leave. That's what I wanted. And so I have to embrace that and remember that I chose to be here. I can't be mad when I'm not here for dinner because I am getting what I wanted. Yeah. It's so easy for people to forget though that mm -hmm. to get that, like what you do, you know, you craft out time to still see them, still spend time with them, which is very, very important. Mm -hmm. There are so many times like, you know, even if someone's downstairs, you just can't have conversation anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, a reason that I always say, like with social media and everything, somebody puts up a Facebook post and well, how many times is it something complaining about something? Yeah. Randomly throwing off a problem like my day was crap. They get three likes, four likes. They keep doing that every single week. The likes keep building up and they feel like they're getting that pat on the back, but it's fake pat on the back. Right. You know, that same reaction. And then the next post they put up after a week of it is one like. Then they're like, what happened? They take it down because they feel like nobody cares about them anymore. And they don't have that pat on the back anymore. Like, where's it at? You right. Know, why is nobody caring? Yeah, I definitely anymore? try to keep my posts as positive as possible. There was times, I mean, I didn't post the fact that I dislocated my shoulder on Christmas break at the end of the holiday. I mean, what's the point? You know, the people that care about it and need to know do. And I overreacted and postponed to my following week's like Saturday appointment because I just thought I'd be out and I'm already healed more than i expected and that's just you know so how mad can i be at the person who didn't come to their appointment since i'm the one to postponed it for hurting myself it was my lack of judgment and i'm not even mad at myself because i just hadn't ever i broke the other end my other shoulder off in 2005 and uh that did take you know from january to march to heal so when i dislocated this arm i just didn't know what to expect and maybe i overreacted uh might have lost a customer but you know it's no, it's just, it's not something to, uh, to get so frustrated over as I used to, I used to get much more frustrated about it. And, you know, I'm talking recently, like yesterday, <laughs> I'm still shaking it out. You know, everybody gets upset about when they can't control things, you know, and, and, and that's kind of part of life is, you know, the better education you get, the better you can control things. You just have to remember that when they get out of control, 
you have to go with the, you have to, you have to also be able to do that. You know, that's like to the point of the river idea of, you know, uh, people who can't update their phone or don't want to learn how a new way of traffic. Uh, some people don't want to put in a traffic circle. Other people, it, science proves that it's better, safer and easier. So we still don't have a traffic circle, <laughs> you know what I mean? A uh, turnabout, you know, what I mean, the simple things like that. And the only reason I know about it is because of bicycling. You know, I, as a pedestrian, I'm a big guy. So people see me. So I have to think like a little person. What does it feel like to really almost get run over more often and looked past? And then how do we include everybody? How is everything, you know, how can any one thing be more inclusive? Bicycle showed me how parks, swing sets, um, those type of things like the parking lots to get into them are not ADA compliant because I can't ride my bike in and out. Although I can do a little stunt, I can do a bunny hop or something to get in there. Uh, if you're at that park long enough, you'll see the guy with the wheelchair and his daughters who can't swing them in the swings. And then that's, you know, and that's, that's kind of similar to a conversation, even without the conversation, just having the time to have been there long enough to see that, um, being more in the moment too. Right. Just take, just being able to, to be present and be there and witness that makes you realize your own potential. You know, don't get mad at the, the OSHA pines cause it's not fixed yet. Figure out how you can get in there and make a, make it better. That's, you know, that's the different way. That's the different train of thought. That's hard to, it's, it's, it, you know, I feel like the, all the different 3G, 4G, 5G, you know, if I was making, if we were plotting out our new, uh, 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 sci-fi movie. It could be that there's so many invisible boundaries on our earth that no children are going to be born with souls anymore. You know, like it's that you can make it that scary, but overall we got to get on with our day. You know, we got to do what we got to do. So being positive and just trying to, you know, literally think locally, act globally. If you think and yeah, if you think and act locally, it affects the globe globally. Yeah. You know, that is the thing to do. You know, if you keep waiting for somebody else to do it, likely it won't happen. You know, I mean, that's pretty much the, how the imagination thing you can only if you, you know, you can imagine stuff, but then you actually have to. Uh, well, it's all about thinking a bigger consideration for others as well, too. Like, you don't have to, you know, it's like when someone you see someone donate at the Salvation Army anymore. I started noticing like during the holidays. I started people saw people donating, but they were wanting the the verbal yeah, thing. Like were, you see me donating, receipt. like I saw oh, a dude I put you, a right. money dance like in and out of the thing. I'm like, what are you Whoa, doing? Like yeah. the guy wasn't even looking at him. And um he finally got the guy's attention. He's like, I'm donating. And the guy's like, Oh yeah, thank you, sir, and all that. And then right. you got the award and everything. It's the same thing with home goods when you donate something, mm -hmm. it's like a penny, they ring the bell. I'm like, don't ring the bell. Because it's not my job. But it's not something I shouldn't do just because it's not my duty. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can help out by doing something. Cause and effect. It's like the training a dog. The, uh, but yeah, you know, it, it's just where we're at in our society. You know, what the, the actual priorities are kind of up for grabs. You know, money's leading the way. <laughs> and I think that, you know, regardless of who's in charge and what they're doing, more people need to get involved with their civic duties. So. I'm trying to make cool ways to do that. And I start out at the tattoo shop and I talk about the bike shop. And then the bikes is the second wave of, you know, being available and letting people express themselves a different way physically, you know, so they can get their emotional kicks out at the tat shop and then their physical kicks, you know, energy burned, riding bikes and stuff. Um, but at some point they're on their own, you know, you can't just always, you can't drive around and pick everybody up for the meeting. <laughs> so that's where I'm at. I got to retire from being the president of the club, remain an active member and supporting member of it. And, you know, I like to joke when people about, you know, when are we riding next? I'm like, didn't you ride your bike already today? You know, <laughs> that's the other answer. You know, yeah, we should plan to ride it in the future, but why haven't, why aren't you telling me where you just rode? Did you ride to the event? Yeah. Did you ride yesterday? You know, like, there's both ways of looking at it. And so without being, dank, you know, dick dank, yeah. <laughs> I can also say it very sarcastically. And there's just so much of that in the world. So my job at this point is to refine my thoughts and statements to as, you know, that PMA, you know, trying to keep a positive mental attitude of my own. And then, you know, it's just, it's hard to believe that it's apparent to other people, but it truly is. Other people notice when you're in a good mood and when you're happy, you know, and kind of energy you get right you know, man, it's, that's all we got energy and that's what i feel like vibrations 
is the energy coming through from the other dimension, you know? Fuck aliens. Interdimensionals is where we're at, you know? Yeah. We're in a dimension. What about all the other dimensions, right? And then how do you contact them? How do you... Why can't you talk to yourself in the present or the past? We have... It, it's an imagination thing. You can imagine it. So when the question was asked to me, what I would tell myself in the past as future Trez... I literally, first thing I thought of instantly, shut the fuck up. Just stop talking so much. And I'm a yap, yap, yap kind of guy. So to make myself happy and know that that's my attribute as well, I've just decided to try to do what I've been saying instead of saying what I'm going to do. And then if I realized, well, you do have to say what you're going to do so that you can get people to do what you were saying. Similar to the yin and the yang. You have to kind of have both. I mean, there's just... There's no way around it. And when you try to get around that, you dislocate your shoulder or you make an enemy. You just don't know what you're doing. You know what I mean? And that's literally the problem. People just don't know what they're doing. And they're so egotistical because you can do whatever you want that they're willing to do things no one's ever been willing to do. Yeah. Well, finding balance. Uh, I mean, I went my whole entire school years, everybody calling me annoying because I talked too much. And then when I got out of high school, I isolated myself completely. And then after three years of it, I was like, I can't do this shit. Anymore. Right. It don't it's work either. Fun. Exactly. That's my point balance, I'm trying to make. You know, I try my best to listen. And at the same Were you the time, guy with the foot that was sure. going like this? Yeah. The foot stomping the floor. Da, 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 doing da, da. a lot more than that. Sharpening the pencil 50 times. Right. Yeah. Me too, part. man. Me too. And it just it takes an effort and a concentration to manage that. You know, and the more you do it for yourself, the happier you'll be and everyone else around you, you know, it just, it, it, that's the hard part is to remember that. So if you can remember to think of yourself as you're in a movie and especially when it comes to making a decision, if you can watch yourself do it, if you can give yourself that second, just take that breath and don't answer the question right away. Answer the question with a question rather than, you know, if you don't have the answer, it's taken me years to accomplish it. And like I said, even yesterday, I didn't pull it off. <laughs> Every day I go to work, I'm like, I'm going to be a better man. I'm going to not say those mean things and stupid stuff that just doesn't need to be in the world. And then on top of that, now I have time to say something more positive. How can I affect this person better? You know, make it better. Um, and then when it's all so annoying, I put those fucking headphones on and put some jam bands on or something, you know, yeah. and, and no one else has to hear it. And then that fixes me again. And then, so, like I said, luckily I've gotten kind of a new lease on life in that regard. It's always hard. You know, everybody has 25 hours in a day and pretty much has it just as hard. No matter how bad your day is going, there's somebody having a worse day and a better day. You know what I mean? And for me, helping the person with the worst day gives me the better day. But some days you do have to help the person that's having a great day. Yeah. Get in there and have a great day with them. You know what I mean? The person who's seeing that has a better day too. It's proven that scientists did a study where a good Samaritan um, of standby, uh, a person that was standing by and another person all had improvements in their um, immune system from doing a good deed, having that deed done to them and fucking witnessing, it. just witnessing it. Yeah. Being well, just seeing someone else being kind to someone made all three people physically better. Being overall positive, I mean, has a, so much benefit that anything that being just negative, you live in a shit spot spin whatever you want to call it the whole entire time you're gonna everything's I mean, gonna be the shore different. we're pretty isolated here so yeah. keep in mind like when you go you know when you travel you can you, that helps a lot alleviate stress and when you come home again you know and even if it's just a concert overnight to philly or something or you know a weekend to the to the woods to go camping you get a newfound respect for it and that's the problem that the cities are causing that the nature can't do anything about you can't just you can't if you if man isolates himself in a city, then that is what he's going to become, you know. Yeah. And I think that's like the idea of smoking a cigarette it makes you look like a factory. You know, now I'm working. <sighs> See the smoke coming out of my yeah. mouth. You know what I mean? Now I'm working. You don't want anyone to not think you're working, you know, and that's a weird thing that we're getting over this last generation. And that's what I'm learning from young people is that I shouldn't put on them the burdens of the past. Like whether or not you go to work every day and work your and work your fingers to the bone is debatable if that's even seriously something people should be doing anymore. <laughs> you know, I mean, like yeah. why, you know, the only reason it's like that is because it is. Well, we live, in a, we live in a world now where it was structured nine to five. That's where you're seeing people become entrepreneurs now. Mm -hmm. All this new era of generation, we just got to move with it. You know, 
All these people right. that are doing self-creative things now. We have a school system, all this stuff that's starting to slowly change, yeah. but not fast enough. Oh, yeah. I can't take my boys snowboarding during the school year because their absences are so critical that the stress level isn't really good enough. And I'm still contemplating trying to do it anyway to take my own advice because when they get back from the ski trip and get through whatever school they missed, they'll remember the trip, not the school. Yeah. And I'm stuck because of the finances and the way the world is right now. There's just not enough snow around here locally and I can't afford to take a trip out West and they're kind of hell bent on going to school. They want to do really well in school. And I can't say that I want to deny that for them. And so rather than pound sand, kick dirt, you know, be a dick, go drinking. I'm trying to just find other ways to keep moving forward with that, you know, Make sure the skiing gear is up to date and their size and ready to go in case it does snow, you know, uh, be that preparedness is what I like about bicycling. It's what I offer people with the tattooing that, you know, they can choose to, to use or disregard, you know, if they want to just rush, you know, I don't want to say rush through it because it's just a different way of doing it. It just causes the same outcome to look different. Also keep in mind that there's another option. feels like for a lot of people, there's just not another option. Right. That's what I don't know. That's what I learned. That's just something inherently within me that I can find, you know, and there was points where I couldn't find it. Um, what the hell's the book? I'm trying to remember the self-help book that I read. Um, I still have it right. That's where the idea of the um, seeing yourself, the idea of seeing yourself and giving yourself that opportunity to uh, see yourself like you're in a movie, like you're watching yourself happen. Um, our friend Emily Crest told me that once, but I know it was in a, another book that we read. And and I, I highly recommend that. You know, books about one's self and mind can't be wrong. You know, the idea of getting into it is just that. You know, you, you've got to make that's a healthy choice to make yeah. and delve into it. Don't be afraid of your own mind. <laughs> you know what I mean? I appreciate you at least doing the podcast, man. It's been Hell forever. Yeah. I've been looking forward to it a long time, Rob. Remember the really first have. time I got a. Kathy on I was like hey now I gotta get you on you're like yeah maybe we can book a tattoo appointment or something well I'm glad we didn't have to come down to a tattoo appointment but I'm glad I could get you on man oh uh, not yet that's what I always say okay. <laughs> thanks for listening to this episode of out of the blank podcast and stay tuned for our next episode